So thank you all for being here. This meetup uh, webinar was initially uh, planned to be uh, two days ago, but I was feeling a little bit under the weather, so we moved it to today. And it seems like uh, some of you joined, so uh, thank you all for being here. So what's the presentation plan? Like I said, we'll be going through some Bitcoin data structures, then we're going to talk about nodes and APIs, what is the verified case study, and what has basically put in a lot of verified focus into Bitcoin data analysis, what is the setup I'll be using today? And, and I'll do some setup and, and I can talk to you about guys about that. I also have some resources on my GitHub, which will help you to set up your own, uh, let's say, uh, environment for you to do some Bitcoin data analysis later. And then we'll jump onto the code and to the results. So first of all, for those who don't know me, my name is Gustavo Flores. I'm head of product and research at Verify. I'm also a developer in JavaScript and React and Node. Uh, I'm very passionate about Bitcoin. Uh, I used to be passionate about blockchain and altcoins as well, but that's long gone. And now my focus is really on Bitcoin uh, and, and what it enables, right? I think it enables uh, freedom. I think it enables sovereignty and, and control to the users and, and to the people. And, and that's why I'm also a firm believer in free market. So uh, I'm a secure Bitcoin custody consultant. So if you have any questions on how to secure your Bitcoins, how to buy Bitcoin, well, we can help with that. So first of all, we're, we're launching a, a platform very soon. Uh, I think you'll be very excited to see what this enables you to do. It's actually, the, in my opinion, the simplest way to buy Bitcoin in Canada. Uh, there's no confusion with other altcoins or with uh, some uh, some trading. It's, it's very straightforward, the action that you have to take for you to be a, a Bitcoin owner, right? We have a throughout platform. So, we also do uh, help people secure those bitcoins when they have once they have them, and we we uh, do Bitcoin consulting for for companies and for folks who who just want to learn Bitcoin, and we can help them through that process. So, like I usually say and usually begin these these presentations, but but it's it's not a, it's not enough. To speak myself here. in a way, Bitcoin is censorship resistant money with limited supply, twenty one million. So what I mean by that is that Bitcoin is uh bitcoin is uh, allows you to do to use it as uh, as you want nobody else can intervene in your bitcoin transactions and that if you have one bitcoin today or if you have half a bitcoin today well as long as bitcoin works you will be sure certain that that one bitcoin is one out of 21 million and that's really valuable right when, once you compare it to other forms of investment once you compare it to other other forms of, of uh, medium of exchange, you see that the high quality that it portrays uh, compared to the other methods. So how is this all possible? This is all possible because uh, I have a computer in my, uh, in my room and 100 other thousand users have computers in their rooms that runs uh, and validates every piece of transaction and every piece of cryptography that is happening on the Bitcoin network at all times. And if you try to shut down one or two, well, good luck shutting down the other 99,000, right? So, and that's how, we're, we're, when we say it's decentralized, that's what we mean. We're not talking about uh, the blockchain or, or mining. We're talking about the fact that anybody can validate uh, and make sure that it's following the appropriate rules, that there really is only 21 million Bitcoins followed by this cryptographic and mathematical rules, right? So, a blockchain is another piece of Bitcoin. How, even if it's not the, the core element, it's still, however, uh, very important because it's the chosen data structure. I'm not saying it's superior to other data structures. However, in this situation, it is quite useful. However, I'm just saying that it's it's the, it's the data structure that was chosen and it's, it's the one that I'll, I'll be talking about to explain my presentation, obviously, right? So a blockchain just means uh, a set of blocks and a block just means an amount of data that is related to other blocks in a cryptographic way. So you see in this example right here that we have uh, block minus three and block n minus three, excuse me. And you see that um, there's a narrow that goes from block n minus two to block n minus three because in a blockchain, the block that that has come after so the, the the newer piece of history is always cryptographically related to the previous piece of history 
And that's why you see there's always a connection between these blocks and this image as you see them on the Bitcoin's blockchain. And so, and then what, what happens? Well, once you have all these blocks and they get validated through a Bitcoin node, like I said, well, they can be stored, which makes them that they can be later analyzed. They can also be analyzed in real time, right? And the most useful way to do this is by using Bitcoin Core. It's just a software you download at bitcoincore.org and that you can just use on your desktop, on your laptop. And there's even some mobile versions, so they're not very well tested. That allow you to verify the Bitcoin blockchain and every piece of data that is it and store it for later analysis purpose. Uh, so you can do that, but you can also use an API. So it, it's just a, for those who are not programmers, it's just a, a better way to, to, it's a better way to connect to an existing software, existing data structures. Uh, and in this case, well, it allows you to code basically with notes. So blockchain.com is a very popular one, probably the most popular option that there's out there. And however, there's, there's some bad sides about it, mostly because it's closed source. So it's only uh, third party hosted and there's no SegWit. So it means that uh, you don't have the latest updates of Bitcoin transactions. So you're missing a lot of data that is normally supposed to appear there. And if you have Bitcoin Core, you would have appear there. So, and third, it's malicious because there's been some uh, tentatives to make some forced updates on the Bitcoin network, which ultimately failed. But blockchain.com was part of that coalition of companies that tried to corrupt the Bitcoin network. So you don't want to deal with that. You can have CypherNode instead, which is open source, constantly updated and self-hosted. So it works in a very similar way. Uh, in the sense, uh, the API works in a very similar way. However, CypherNode, you have to install it, which is pretty straightforward. And then you can analyze blockchain data uh, as you would with blockchain.com. But those are about some, some, some other APIs. But what if we want something in the middle? What if I don't want to do all the self-hosted installation because I just want to analyze some data and I'm not very much looking after authenticity of my coin? No, you want to make sure the coins you receive are authentic. Else, what are you holding? Are you really holding one out of 21 million bitcoins? Won't you verify the brick of gold you get uh, when you make it when you make a gold investment? Won't you verify the $100 bills you get at the bank? Sure, you will. So Bitcoin, you will do the same thing as well. Uh, and so I don't want to do that, Cyphernode, because I'm not talking about holding coins. And it's it's a process that I do on my own, but I'm just not going to do in this webinar. Uh, however, blockchain.com is pretty malicious, so I can go with something in between. And that's what Blockstream Explorer is, uh, or what I called in the in the title of the presentation, Blockstream API. It's just a, the, the, the Explorer is a software that is open source and self-hosted. However, it's quite heavy because it's an enterprise level uh, Explorer or web API software, which means that it contains uh, many databases and ledgers of Bitcoin data uh, structure in different ways. So you can, let's say you're searching an address, you'll find all the transactions related by, to that address. Let's say you're searching uh, master public key, you'll find all the address related to that master public key. So for that to be easy and fast, you need to have some databases that list basically all the addresses that are currently, uh, currently have coins and all the coins that they have in it. When you're running a Bitcoin node, for example, you don't have those data structures. Uh, well, you have the same data, but it's just structured in a different way. It goes, you have a, you have them by blocks. So let's say if I have an address and I want to find all the coins that I have in that address and I have a Bitcoin core node, well, I just go and I look every block. Does this block contain a transaction related to my address? No, okay, next block. And it's much faster than as I say it, but it's still, quite long to go block by block when you're searching address by address, which is something different that is done through Blockstream Explorer. And that's why it's very heavy. It requires more than 1.5 terabytes of available disk space uh, before compaction. After compaction, it goes around 700 uh, gigabytes, if I'm not mistaken. So it's also a web explorer and, an AP and, and a web API. Uh, and as I can show you here, you can see that it's it's a Bitcoin block explorer that you can go at blockstream.info. They also have some Tor, Onion, V3, and V2 uh, 
uh, available for a Tor browser for, for extra privacy between you and Blockstream. Uh, but if, I don't, if I'm not uh, very worried about that because I'm not looking at my particular transactions, I can just go here on blockstream.info and we can see, let's say, this block. Well, here are all the transactions. It's like a common explorer, right? You, you've seen them probably before. Uh, however, there's an API related to this, and I can find here that documentation related to the API. And blockstream.info as Explorer, this GitHub open source project, it's the same thing. It's just uh, blockstream.info is third-party hosted. Instead, Explorer would be self-hosted if I decide to, to self-host it, right? So here you have the API documentation, and you can see it's quite straightforward, such as get transaction uh you look up a transaction id and then you'll find the information about the transaction right uh so this is all very good for bitcoin data analysis uh and and that's how and, and you can see the api let's say here i just write blockchain.info slash api and it, as if i'm communicating with the api i write block and the block hash and transactions to see the transactions related to the block and you see that i have all the transactions of the block in a nice JSON format that I can look up visually. However, I'm probably more interested with c calling this information with a JavaScript code, probably, or, or some other code, right? So if I'm back to the presentation, uh, so Blockstream Explorer is the solution that I've decided uh, for this presentation and for a lot of purposes when it comes to Bitcoin data analysis. So. I'm gonna do a little course on Bitcoin data structures and, and I'm gonna use precisely the, the what I showed you on uh, Blockstream API uh, to do that. So, so first of all, there's a block. A block is just like I show you here, uh, a block is just a combination, uh, an update to the history of Bitcoin. Every, around every 10 minutes, there's a new block, which means there's an update to the history of Bitcoin transactions. This, these are, this is the latest state of the Bitcoin network of the Bitcoin transactions made between the Bitcoin users, right? So you have the what's called the Bitcoin header, uh, which contains what is the height of the Bitcoin block. Confirmed, in this case it is, and it only has one confirmation to mean that it's the latest block, like I said earlier. Timestamp, which means this around what time. It doesn't come out exactly at this. It comes out in, in Unix time, uh, but this is translated for, for better uh, vis visual visuality. So then the size, how much this space does it con does it take uh, in, in my note? You see this just switch from one to two means that there's another block that has been found and a new piece of history that has been added. Sure, it was only six minutes between this and the other block, but it's an average of 10. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. So you see that weight units, uh, Bitcoin has a weight unit limit. Uh, and I, uh, you can ask that uh, if you want more details on that at the end, if you don't know what it means. But basically, it's just a way instead of uh, having the, a block size limit. Now we have a block weight limit, which gives advantage to SegWit transactions to be uh, so you can include in the block more SegWit transactions than non-SegWit transactions. And that's why we say SegWit helps scaling. Then you have other some details, but then you have all the transactions. And that's how a block is, right? You have all the transactions. So, and, and in here we have it in, in the other format where we see zero. Well, it's just the first one, right? Because usually we begin by zero. And you see the transaction ID here, we see it. Well, it's the same thing that's well, it's not exactly the same block, uh, but okay, I can, I can probably do it with the same block so that it becomes clearer. Just a second, uh, I can just take the hash here. Okay, so just a second. Okay, so you see the transaction ID is now the same uh, here and here. I'm just doing this so later when we're coding uh, and you're showing how I'm getting the, 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 the data and I'm analyzing how am I uh, able to know which piece of data means what, right? Because I can see it here visually, it's much more clear than I can adapt it to this. And then when I'm coding, I, I can just be, be understand what I'm doing basically. So here's the transaction ID. Here you have the VIN. VIN just means the inputs. So basically what happens on this side, it means the coins that you're spending and outputs means the coins that get out of the transaction. So a transaction is never like 
uh, I send to you. A transaction is always like, I take this coin and this coin, let's say a coin of 0 0.05 Bitcoin and this coin of 0 0.02, and I send you 0 0.04 and I send back to myself, but to another address. So it's not exactly here that it's back to myself, 0 0.01. And the difference between what I, the, the inputs and the outputs is the transactions fees that are paid to the miners. And this is what you see uh, in, in, uh, and this is what you will see in some explorers here. However, it's not that uh, visually clear how much is the, the amount that you're paying to the miners, uh, but you can calculate the difference between this and this, right? So uh, here are some, you see some transactions have only one input, but here let's see you have two inputs. And you have two outputs. Uh, and so you can see them here if you see VIN. Uh, I don't know if it's clear, but uh, I hope it is. You can see VIN and you can see transaction ID here. This is how to identify the, the, the VIN. Uh, these are the valves, so the outputs. And here you have a lot of data, and we'll go through the data in one second. So you see that. And here, let's say you have a, no, uh, a one, which means we're into the, the other transaction. Um, and then you have some VINs here. A one and, and about here so so that's pretty much how it is and another thing that you can t then you have to know is um, what you don't see when you check a VIN when you check inputs you don't see that it came from an address there's a misconception in Bitcoin that Bitcoins come from addresses and that's not exactly true Bitcoins when you send Bitcoins you send them to an address you're basically just sending them to you're basically sending them somewhere which uh, is associated, an address, which is associated to a condition for it to be spent. So once it's spent, like it's spent in the inputs side of these things, well, it doesn't say it's coming from this address. It's just saying you just spent these coins that were associated with this, with this uh, transaction ID or this uh, UTXO ID that can bring you to a previous transaction where well, this was an output and uh, it was associated with an address. So let's say if I click here in this, uh, I can see that in here, it's an output. It's basically this, what I've, what I've clicked on. Uh, this is the output that later becomes an input. And this was the transaction that it, this was a transaction where it was an output and which created initially. Uh, however, later it became an input uh, when uh, in the in the other in this situation where I've showed you, right? Uh, so you see, it's not uh, you don't see the address where it comes from. You only see uh, the the pre valve we call it, or basically the previous output that it it was uh, when it was created. However, when you're making an output, you see the address and you see the amount. Uh, you also see some other stuff. Let's say we're gonna check uh, this transaction. Uh, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna try to find uh, one that's uh, segwit. Uh, for sure, which uh, shouldn't be too long. So you, you see here in this transaction, 58 BC. So this is, uh, is there a number? See, I'm just going to search it, 58 BC. So you see here, we have so many inputs and so many outputs. Like we have 13 inputs, uh, even 14 inputs because it begins at zero. And we have uh, 17 18, uh, 19 outputs, excuse me. Uh, so let's say we want to look up how does it look difference between this, which begins by a three, this, which begins by a one, and let's say this, which begins by a C, B, okay? So I'm going to go here and I'm going to look up the vault and I just close the VIN so that I can go straight to the outputs and I can check the, I wanted to check the first and the second. So the first begins by a three. So here we can see uh, the script pop key, the script pop key ISM, or even the type. So this just means that uh, this is the signature uh, related to this transaction. This is the, the, the script type, pay to script hash. This just means that uh, for this transaction to be spent, it has to fulfill a script. And that script is written here. 
uh, or patch 160. Um, there's we can we could look up the details, but I'm not gonna go too far on on what uh, the scripts and the Bitcoin smart contracts means. But you just see what is associated with, and you see the value here. It's not exactly in Bitcoin. I don't think I've, it's in Satoshi's, in Satoshi's, which is 100 one out of 100 millions uh, of Bitcoin. So uh, we see the first one. However, it's a pay to public key hash. This just means that it's sent directly to an address and whoever has the, excuse me, it's sent directly to a public key uh, and it's hashed. So you, you folks don't see what the public key is, but whoever has the private key can demonstrate that he is the one whose private key is associated with the public key that was hashed in this precise output. Uh, so it's different than the pay to script hash where there is a script associated with it. And the script, what can be the script very briefly? The script can be, is this a multi-sig transaction where there's many, uh, there's many uh, like co-signers who own Bitcoins together. Or they can be a time lock, which says you have to wait uh, six months in terms of blocks because Bitcoin doesn't know what a month is, but does know what a block is. In terms of blocks, uh, you cannot spend these coins for at least six months. So uh, this is what a script would mean. And if we go to the eighth, which I wanted to show to you, uh, what was it? This is a pay to witness public key hash. This is uh, what's called a a script, uh, a secret transaction, which uh, has uh, uh, quite some differences in, in the way that it's built uh, because it sends the transaction, uh, it separates uh, the transactions in the sense that it sends the witness somewhere else. So uh, this is basically what all these transactions uh, look like. Uh, so like I said, you have the script type uh, that you can find here. So if let's say we want to look up all those that are paid to script hashes, well, I could just say, hey, look up every block, look up every transaction in every block, and every time and look up every output of every transaction of every block. And every time it, the script pub key uh, uh, type is paid to script hash, well, uh, do sum plus one or import it to my spreadsheet. And, and import the, 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 the amount. And then we just additionate the amount and we do every month, how does it look? And then we can see uh, transactions, is it going higher, lower? How does it compare to other script types? Uh, and that's basically how you do Bitcoin data analysis, right? So uh, I think that's, uh, I explained it all throughout it all, but if you have any more questions, don't forget to ask them at the end. Uh, in regards of this, but I'll move on. So that's when the verified case study came in and we basically did an analysis where after understanding all these data structures and, and what we could leverage uh, these for, uh, we did an analysis that demonstrated that uh, around 55,000 uh, Bitcoins uh, would have been saved in, in fees, which amounts to a lot of money around nearly half a billion dollars uh, and well, when we did the article, it has risen a, a little bit. I think now it's uh, 550 billion million, um, which is a lot of money, right? Since 2012, yeah, that's been a while. But what do you think it's it's, it's going to be worth when Bitcoin is worth much more, right? And how much do you think our fees are going to continue to to evolve as a market and and, and in value, right? Like uh, most of what we calculated that was saved wasn't saved in 2012, was saved in 2017, 18, even, even 20. So uh, it's all very relevant. So you can find uh, this on our website. You just go to our blog and you'll find a case study associated. Uh, and, and that's when, and that's what we'll be looking at today, the, the code that I use to, to make this and, and what else things you, you can use it uh, to, and you can modify it for your own purposes. So, uh, what we will be will be setting up right now because I'm gonna go to the more practical side of the presentation, and uh, so you'll be using Node. Uh, excuse me, oops. You'll be using Node, uh, Yarn, and Airtable to begin with. Node is just like the 
the server side JavaScript um, uh, programming language. So instead of using JavaScript that runs on the browser, which allows me to do uh, basically using Firefox and allows me to make a presentation and mostly like front end graphical stuff, uh, Node is more for uh, which is the server side. Of, of, of things, right? It's it's it leveraged the the V8 machi uh, machine uh, by uh, Google and it allows to run JavaScript code on the server. And this allows me to do quick scripts uh, that have no front end code, but just run uh, get in terms of data analysis are, are very useful. So Yarn is just like npm, uh, a very basic uh, package management. Uh, uh, dependency for, for Node, and uh, Airtable is just uh, like spreadsheets on, on the web. It's kind of like Google Sheets, but it's easier for developers and for, let's say, uh, Node.js particularly. So I'll begin with showing you my GitHub, which contains um, the necessary scripts for setup. So this is just a very simple script that you can find here. It's a bash script. That basically just does the Yarn installation and the NVM installation I use, which is Node version manager. Because very often when you're coding in Node, you'll be you'll have to switch from Node 12 to Node 3 to Node 10. So NVM just allows you to install them very easily. So you see here, um, I begin by installing uh, some dependencies, then Yarn in here, then. Uh, I install NVM here, and then I do NVM install 12.0, which means install Node.js 12.0, and then I use 12.0. I do git clone to clone this repository of GitHub. I do I go in through the folder, so I can I can do that right now. Uh, let's say I I go here and I go make the demo too. CD demo two. This just means I just went into this folder. I'll go. I'll do git clone. So I just clone this repository. I'll go here. CD all. Oops. Okay. So I'm here. I could do code to open Visual Studio Code, and you can see I, I can find this script here as well. Visual Studio Code is like uh, is is what I use. To, to, to code in what most developers use, I think. It's probably the most popular either in JavaScript or Python or, or C Sharp, or whatever you, you, you're coding on. Probably not Java, but, but most else is, is available here. So then uh, what I could do is I will have to create, uh, and you can find the information here on the, in the description here, in file that contains basically all these information. So my API key for my Earth table, because if I want to write into my Earth table by importing, exporting my data into the, those spreadsheets, well, I have to have my API key. I have to have a destination. I have to have a table. So I can get all this information. Uh, and I have, once I do, I create a spreadsheet in Earth table. Well, I have to fit it. For this situation, I fitted it with block time, block height. What, what we saved in terms of block uh, block space. So I put block saved. Uh, no, this was in case, uh, this was for the fees, how much fees were saved in a, in a block uh, through the, the modeling that we did, how much fees were paid in normal times, what was the real weight, the real size, or the new weight and the new size after we, we, we did the adjustments. So I'll go very quickly, uh, set up here. Uh, with Gorilla Mail, I can set up. Uh, um, I can let me do this. I'll create a new email. You can just create like disposable emails in, in two seconds with this. So I'll go on our table. Let me log out from this account. Uh, and I can just create a new. Uh, account very quickly with this. Uh, sign up for free. Uh, Gustavo Boris. Well, I'm not going to write my name. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, email, well, whatever this was. Create a password. Uh, I don't know. 
Bitcoin is the best. Sign up for free. So uh, I'll receive a, I'll skip this. Oops, what was that? Okay, so it's loading. I'll receive an email here to confirm that I, I, I got it. Uh, but I can skip all this. I can directly just create, uh, just, I'll start from scratch. I, I really don't need a, the, the template stuff from here. So I'll just go here and I'm already on a spreadsheet as you see. And I can already start formatting it with what I needed here. So let's say block time, block height, block saved. So these are all like uh, numbers, right? Uh, so I can already begin by putting here block time and you can choose here like this is going to be a number. So it's you, you see it's much more developer friendly than let's say uh, Google Sheets. With, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's very similar. Like Don't get me wrong. It's... Uh, there's not much difference. So you see, I'm going to just format it very quickly. Okay. And once I formatted it, well, then I have to get all my Airtable data. So uh, what is the, 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 the ID of this sheet? What is my API key? What is my uh, the title of the sheet? So here is table one. Uh, so all that data has to be later copied into my code, uh, or at least a dedicated file that will have, let's say, all my environment data uh, that will allow me to to connect to this spreadsheet through a programmable interface. Okay. So do I have everything now? No, I'm just missing the last one. Okay. Okay. So now it's all here. Uh, I think I have to go. How do I get API? Uh, was it's been a while. I haven't done it. It's probably it's just around here. Uh, do I have to validate first? Yeah, I think I have to confirm first. Okay, confirmed email. Okay, perfect. I think it's maybe here, account. Yeah, generate API key, that's it. Okay, so I copy this key and I'll copy it here. I'll do a nano.env, which just means I've created uh, a file with uh, the, the, the information here. So I'll copy this. Uh, Okay, so I have my Airtable API key and I just paste it here. It's right here. Oops. Excuse me. Okay, so that's pasted there. And then I'm going to grab the title of this. I'm going to call it uh, data sheet. Uh, I'm going to put this in the earth table table. And the base, what is the base string? Is how, how did I find it? Um, I think it was. I have to go somewhere else. It's probably here. API documentation. That's it. So this is uh, the ID of this base is that's it. Okay, so there you have there I have all my data. Uh, so I'm ready to go on. And now I can, I'm go, I go back here and let's say I, I already have the code and, and it's ready to go. So, so uh, and if I just run it, you would see that it appears, uh, it, it just appears. Well, first, before doing this, I actually have to, uh, if I still look at this uh, file with the script, um, well, you see that I already, this is just to automatically like print uh, this data in the environment file, but I did it manually. And now I just have to do yarn. 
which will install all the dependencies. So this was done very quickly. And now if I do this, well, it, it's, pro it's, it's gonna work. You see, it's, it's, it's already running. But I'm not gonna do this right now. I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna look into the, into the file with you. Um, so I have here, uh, here's the complete file. Uh, let's say I, I do a copy, paste, we're gonna call this uh, rename, call this demo, and we're gonna look into this. Um, okay, so here you see we can make a few changes like that. So here there's there's some basic stuff that you don't want to change here. Like it's 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 just it's the setup, it's the environment, uh, it's it's just the way to it's let's say it's the framework that that you will need to do this. So like importing some libraries such as Airtable, such as uh, Fetch, which just will allow you to, to, to pull external data, uh, like .env, which will just say that your configuration will appear in the, in the file that I created. These things are, are very basic, colors, retry. Uh, these things are very basic. You probably don't want to move them around. Uh, and some other, let's say in this case, well, this is my descriptive error. so. This remains here. If, if let's say I wasn't printing this data, if I was printing something else, well, I would just tell the user, hey, instead of naming your earth table in this way, well, name it in a different way, right? Uh, so so that's what, what I would say. But in this situation, this is what I will leave it at. And then you see here, this is just a, some basic stuff just to like, uh, to, 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 it's a test. It's just, does the user have his API key? Uh, else throw the descriptor error, right? This wouldn't work unless you, you use it here. Uh, so, and here's some more data, and this is more like constant, like you see. And we have like some external functions at the end, which are, some are Bitcoin related, some are not. So let's say you see this function, this is a, the write to earth table function. So instead of having all this code inside the main inside the main function, we'll just have it somewhere else uh, where you can just call write to a table instead of writing this whole script, right? Because basically that's what we do when we're programming. We're, we're, we're having a main function, which just uh, holds, which just calls to external functions, either probably asynchronous functions. Uh, and this, this is just done uh, without having to, to reproduce the code here, to rewrite the code all the time. We can just call it whenever we need it and it will run outside well it will run inside the function but in a, a synchronous way so uh and here what I'm, i want to show you here is the bitcoin code so basically what this does is uh the framework what the framework does and that's what i, I want to look at first the framework what it does is that these are just constant so, so don't worry about that so the main function is just um it begins at uh, what you name start at block. So if you tell, when I run this function, I will usually say start this function particularly, I'm talking about all functions, but this function that I created, I'm going to say start at this block and end at this block. In reality, this goes in a decreasing format, so it shouldn't be like this, it should be the, the other way. It should be the other way around, where you begin at 37, uh, 637 200 and then you goes to 634 200 and then you analyze the 3000 blocks that are in there uh, it should go like that so this basically you're telling him begin at uh this number 637 200 because this is what you you're indicating what start at block is so you say main run the main function here with start at block which is 637 200 and then it runs that okay and if uh Okay, so, and then it uh, it does have, you, you did write a start at block, so it doesn't go with this because it's optional to write start at block. If you don't mark start at block, it will just scan from height. It will look at the latest, uh, you see here, it will call blockstream API with tip height. So it means it would start at the beginning, the latest block. But if you tell him start at this block, it, it won't do this. What it will do is it will get the 10 latest blocks because that's how Blockstream API works. You get 10 blocks at a time. Okay. And it will, first of all, it will look. Is the stop block here because you have inserted a stop block? Is the stop block here? Well, if it is, we're just going to stop after that. If it's not, we're going to move on. So it gets the 10 blocks 
and it, and, and it calls it batch of 10 blocks. And once it, and this is a function for if the stop block is here. So we're going to pass through that. And once it does that, it, it tells async for each. So let's, we're going to do an asynchronous function for each of these ones. And we're going to, uh, for each block inside the batch of 10 blocks. So now we've taken 10 blocks and we're going to check one block by one. And whatever is included inside this function, so from here to here, from line 108 to line 159 will be done for each of these blocks that was pulled from the 10 blocks here. And that's where the magic really happens, right? Uh, you're looking up each block and then you can look up each transaction in each block and then you can look up each output in each block. And that's how you do, you can do an analysis of outputs, right? Um, so, and and then, um, and, and that's pretty much it. And then here, what, I'm, I'm still explaining the framework of this. Well, here, this is non-framework related, so we can, let's say we can erase it for now, um, or at least comment it. We're just gonna comment it so that it's not running. Um, so you see here, however, that there's a di another function here that will take not only it will inside the block already it will take every 25 transactions and it will go on to the next 20 batch of 25 transactions so basically it's going to go through all the transactions in this block 25 at the time so i don't know if what you saw what we did here we took 10 blocks and then we took each one of those 10 blocks and then inside each one of those 10 blocks we took 25 transactions and then inside that batch of transactions, we do here async for each on each transaction of that batch of transactions. So we got trend blocks, one block, 25 transaction in that block, each transaction in that block. And that means that we're going to loop through that. We're going to do each transaction in those 25 transactions. Once we finish that, we're going to grab another batch of 25 transactions in that block. Once we do that, we're going to batch we're going to do the next block. And once we finish the, the 10 blocks, we're going to grab another batch of 10 blocks until we get to the stop at block. So we wanted to analyze 10,000 blocks. We're going to do the 10 block batch 1,000 times. And inside the batch of transaction, that usually is when I do the transaction uh, calculations, right? So in this case, the, the segwit stuff. So, OK. So, and, and this is where the magic is. However, you can also take some, let's say, uh, let's say I want to, in this case, know what the block time is, like, uh, because what do we want to have here? That's the question we want to ask ourselves. We want to have the block time. We want to have uh, the block fees. And we want to have, uh, and the block weight, the block size. But we also want to have uh, some, some non-existent values that we will model, such as how many sieves could have been saved, what will be the new weight, and what will be the new size. So for block time, block height, block uh, real weight, and real size, if you remember how when we looked at here, these informations appear in somewhere here. So let's say uh, the block height, well, if you if if we look up just the block because uh if you remember here if we look here you can find the block height right here we can find the the size right here the white is right here so um and even that timestamp is right here so these informations are already quickly accessible in the block header so that's why you see in my code i don't wait to analyze each transaction i directly catch the the information block timestamp block height block weight block size i already catch it as soon as i get the block when i do um uh, a sync for each block i'm already saying uh, my block data my block time will be the block dot timestamp and when i do block dot timestamp i'm just saying the block that i imported from Blockstream API dot timestamp. So if you go here, this is the block 
you dot timestamp because here is timestamp. So basically what I'm just doing is taking block that you see this here, it's right here, block and timestamp. Or if I would say block version, well, this would appear, this would be imported into Airtable, right? Uh, so I take block dot timestamp, block dot height, block dot weight, block dot size, and it gives me all these data that I want here, and it brings them here uh, much later. However, I want to get block saved, which is the save the fees that would be saved after uh, the, the the it's applied, the modifications are applied, the new weight and the new size. So to do that, I have to do uh, calculations on each transaction on each output. And that's when the other part of Bitcoin code happens, because this is really pretty straightforward. You just import stuff with here, this function that imports 10 blocks from Blockstream API. And for each block, you just associate it, where you just associate uh, inside a, uh, an object, you just say block time equals uh, this amount that you that I've just imported from Blockstream dot info right so it's pretty straightforward however for the other things how do i proceed so and you see that block saved well i begin at zero however new weight and new size i begin at the same amount of this and to get to the new weight i will just reduce it with later on so i will begin with the total and then i will just trim it away what i want to what i calculate that should be removed the same thing for size however save i'm gonna go the other way around i'm gonna add it up so if we go inside the the other bitcoin code which is uh here so you see here block data dot block save or block data dot new size and new weight which are the ones that i was thinking of here well they're defined here and here is their calculate so how are they calculate so if we look at this precise part of the code you see that, you know, let me zoom a little bit. First of all, you see that this is an async for each of, out of this batch of 25 transactions, we're gonna loop through each transaction. So first of all, uh, we are saying constant segwit saved equals calculate segwit fee gains transaction in parentheses. So this just means, let's, let's take the transaction, all the transaction data, Let's insert it in this function, calculate segwit fee gains. And the results out of this, uh, let's say that it's called segwit saved. So when later, when I'm giving the, uh, the data to these three, which I was, which is my goal, well, I'm just gonna say segwit save dot potential back 32 gains. So now I have to look what happens inside this function. This is the question. The function that I insert my transaction on, calculate segwit fee gains, what happens there? So I can find that uh, function uh, somewhere else. So let me uh, search it, and here it is. It's the end, uh, because that's what you can do very often. You can just segregate parts of your code uh, if you don't need them to be in the main function. So here you see that my calculate segwit fee gains uh, function is very complicated, okay, uh, to say the least. So it begins right here and it ends towards here. So it's uh, pretty, pretty long, 50, 55 lines long. So first of all, um, what I wanna do is I wanna calculate, I wanna check each output of each transaction uh, and I wanna calculate whether they are um, segwit or non-segwit uh, and I'm gonna, no, excuse me, I'm gonna check, check each input uh, and I'm gonna check whether they're segwit, non-segwit uh, and if they're non -se if they're segwit, well, I just know there's no potential to gain from being segwit because it already is, it's already living up to its maximum potential. However, if it's non-segwit, well, then I will make the, 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 the transformation. So uh, let's see here, we go, uh, we have a transaction and then we say for each VIN, for each out input of that transaction, let me um, let me check. Is it a public key hash? Is it a pay to script hash? Is it a pay to witness script hash? Because it, it really varies one from the other, how much fees you save. Like it's uh, because they're all very different sizes. 
So here in this uh, function, you see that if it says that if this is pay to script public key hash, well, it's uh, it's uh, it's pay to script public key hash right here. Um, well, it's not going to save anything because uh, excuse me, it is going to save uh, around this amount because this is some numbers that I got from Blockstream Explorer, which tells me exactly the size of these transactions versus the, the segwit ones. So here I have the gains, and I just calculated in 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 the in the constants that I'm importing later in to calculate the ultimate uh, numbers. And I have all these situations here, uh, and I just calculate: is it uh, backward compatible segwit, which is paid to script hash, paid to witness public key hash? So it is segwit, but it is it can still make some gains. Here is another form of backward compatible segwit which can make even more gains. So, so uh, and here is just non-segwit, so it's basically full gains. Um, and full gains here are script six size vim times three, because this is the function of uh, how you turn a segwit, a non-segwit transaction into a segwit transaction. You just take the script six size and you move it so that it's counted uh, as one instead of it being counted as four. Um, and and I, I, we, we, we are going to do some more presentations about SegWin and how it works, but this is uh, how you need to know, basically. The data that is the script SIG is, is just not going to be included in the same place. It's going to be included somewhere else, and it makes it count as a fourth of the size as it used to count. So anyways, once you do all, the, all this and you classificate each input, depending where they go, well, you can just, I can just go through each input of each transaction and I can add it to the totals. So I just, and I have here um, the weight loss. Uh, if I want to calculate the transaction weight loss, well, it's, it's just a weight loss. I just add it up, right? Each transaction, I have my weight loss, my size loss, and I want to know how much potential BEG32 gains I made in the sense I want to have the percentage. So I just divide weight loss by transaction weight so that I know how much I lost versus how much I had. This give me the percentage of savings. So let's say I, I lose 10 uh, bytes, but I had 100 bytes. Now my potential gains are 10%. And that's how I know I've made a 10% improvement. So anyways, when I call this function calculate segwit fee gains, I will get this. This is what will be returning. Uh, this will not look like this, will be potential back 32 gains, and this will be an amount, uh, a number, right? Same for this, same for this, same for this. So here, when I go here, I know that segwit save contains those three numbers that I just said inside that object, okay? So, and then I just validate that my transaction, uh, if I look here, and don't worry, we're almost done. If I look here, I see that the first transaction uh, doesn't have a fee. If I go here, fee is zero because it's the first transaction in each block. Never has a fee because it's the transaction where the miner receives the reward. And because of that, uh, he doesn't pay a fee because obviously he's not paying a fee to himself. So I just have to make sure that I'm not including this one uh, because it's a zero, so I don't want to include it. And so I say if transaction type of transaction fee equals number, well, just do this calculation. And this calculation will say the new weight reduce the weight loss from that transaction. And basically, I will loop in through each transaction of that block in this. So I will begin with the block weight. And for each transaction, I will reduce the weight loss. So every time I'll just reduce a little bit. I'll trim, trim, slowly trim it to get to the real data amount that I'm looking for. Same thing for the size. I'm just going to trim it slowly, each transaction, looping through them. And when I'm doing block saved, well, I have something a little bit more complicated. Instead, if I'm just going to do transaction fee, the fee that I paid, the times the percentage that I save in weight, because this is the weight will give me the fee. So if I have, I'm saving 10% in weight, I'll be saving 10% in fee. And this is, and all the fee, basically this just gives me the savings. 
and I put it and add it up to block save. Instead of trimming it, I'm adding it up. So each transaction that is that has inputs that weren't segwit but could have been segwit will just be added here, and we'll just uh, and w at the end I'm gonna have a total for the block that will have the the, the amount that I saved. So I'm gonna run this 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 the, the code so you can see what happens. Okay, so I see I run the code. First of all, and, and what I and if you want very briefly, I can put some console logs so you see what is being pulled or, or, or fetched. So let's say I'm gonna put a, a console log uh, very briefly here. Okay, console log block. So you see this. Uh, am I running demo? No, I should run demo. Okay, so you see it pulled uh, a block and I printed the block here, so you see the ID, the height, everything is right here. This is directly from Blockstream Explorer. It's, there's no coincidence. It looks exactly similar as it looked here, right? Because I'm, I'm getting it from there. So then I could do, uh, I could console log some other things, but, but you get the point, right? Uh, you get the point. So I'm just gonna run the code and you see we go through this first transaction. This is the block. Uh, this is some other stuff that I was console logging earlier um, that you'll find uh, that is foundable somewhere else. Here, when I have a function that gets me the block fee, it just goes to the Coinbase transaction and it gets the, the Coinbase transaction. So here you see, I just did one block and this is the result of that block. It basically ran through each transaction and it gave me this, right? Uh, so I have my block saved and my new weight. Um, and you see, let's say, I, I could already see the, the, the difference between the block fee and what's saved, right? I can already see the difference between the weight, the real weight and the new weight. I see that it went from 4 million weight units to 2.5 million weight units. So it's reduced 1.5 out of 4, which is pretty considerable, right? It's like 40%. So, uh, so you see, you, see you, you, you already start seeing things like this. And once it gets to 10, uh, it will import 10 at a time into the spreadsheet. Uh, because I don't want to, I have a, you, you often have a rate limit in Airtable and, uh, and uh, some other spreadsheets online where you cannot uh, import like, uh, you cannot do like 1,000 calls a second, right? You're limited in the, in the amount of calls you can make per second or imports you can make. So I, I bring them 10 at a time to, to reduce that throughput uh, that I have limits on. So I'll just wait so that it's imported on the air table uh, and then we'll be basically done with the presentation today. Mm. Okay, so it's not gonna be long. So I'll be back on the slides. Um, so basically that's it for now about very briefly something that we've been preparing if you want to know more on this subject on bitcoin development uh, on segwit batching on just how to make use bitcoin apis develop bitcoin apps eventually develop bitcoin code while well, we're organizing the 22nd of july at 10 a.m uh, eastern daylight time so basically new york montreal time we're going to be organizing uh, myself, Gustavo, Director of Marketing at Verify My Check, and CEO at Bull Bitcoin, Francis Polio. We're going to be making a, a technical seminar. This is going to be around three hours long, where we're going to go through SegWit, batching, what is all of this, uh, but also how to use it, how to implement it. And also, Francis is going to talk about some real life situations where he has to dealt with. Uh, applying these Bitcoin technologies and finding issues that almost no one deals with. Uh, so we can speak uh, of, of real experience in this presentation. So you see here the, the full agenda in the in the in here it's gonna cost uh, it's 150 uh, US dollars. you can purchase uh, as soon uh, very soon uh, it's gonna be on sale. Um, very soon and you'll be able to purchase uh, and you can also hit us up if you have questions if you want to make modifications we're going to go through really everything we're going to go through bitcoin core json rpc endpoints uh, how batching really works cypher node and some new tools that cypher node is work cypher node developers such as francis and uh, kexki are working on to implement some 
uh, automatic batching for like enterprise level batching and SegWit a lot of insights from Francis about SegWit as well and a lot of technical uh, course on, on this on what is SegWit how to construct SegWit transactions and how to leverage APIs Cypher or Bitcoin Core uh, and we're going to have more, uh, much more in this. In the coming quarter, we're going to be working much more courses and content uh, like this, upgraded content. If, if you want to be a developer, this is your chance. If you want to be uh, good um, in, in, in Bitcoin uh, technical stuff, well, this is your chance. So uh, don't hesitate to uh, send me a question if you have any. So I have references about my presentation here and I'll be sending the presentation on the chat uh, right now because I'm uh, over and you can ask me any questions now. So follow us on verify.io or verify BTC on Twitter and you can contact me at gustavo at verify.io for any questions. So uh, thank you and I'll take any questions now. Okay, so I still already have some questions on the chat from Austrian 160 boy. So thank you for the questions. So and thank you for saying this was a great presentation. So yes, the blockstream utility is very promising because it's, it's really uh, easy to onboard, but it's also it can also be done in a sovereign way where you host it yourself. Like, like I said, so does Verify work closely with the blockstream team? We had uh, had some some communication. We don't have any official uh, uh, like partnership with Blockstream. Uh, they have collaborated with us on uh, one of the Liquid Network articles that we did. They gave us some addition and correction, and they've also we also had some discussion about uh, some other things, but nothing too concrete yet. Uh, however, how competent are they? Uh, they're extremely competent. So first of all, uh, technically, I'd say Blockstream has. Uh, the, the most advanced Bitcoin core developers and application development, they're extremely good as well. Uh, if just Blockstream Green or Explorer, uh, many tools, and, and they're very much dedicated to Bitcoin open source development uh, because their business strategy relies a lot in, in the Bitcoin investment. So it's not, they don't have a, uh, because of that, they're very much committed to Bitcoin open source development. Uh, so, particularly on work related to Blockstream's Lightning Network initiatives. So, Lightning Network initiatives on Blockstream are, let's say, much of a focus than, let's say, Liquid um, and Bitcoin core initiatives. Uh, so, and the Lightning Network Blockstream implementation is called Seed Lightning. And I'd, I, I'd say uh, LND is probably moving faster, but I'd say Seed Lightning is extremely well suited for enterprise and server situations for a line network, much less desktop and, and let's say uh, uh, regular consumer user experience. Uh, for HSM, hardware security models with line network. That's kind of the vision they have. And I think uh, it has a lot of potential. I've worked on C-Lightning. I've done, a, I think I've done a presentation with C-Lightning as well. And it's a really good tool. The, the guys, I talked to Christian Decker uh, like last year, we, we did an interview in another focus where where we did a co-research with Blockstream Research, uh, Blockchain Research Institute. And Christian Decker is, is the first PhD in Bitcoin from 2013. He ha he's been working on Bitcoin since 2009. He has been thinking about Lightning Network since the beginning. So they definitely have the most competitive devs in terms of Bitcoin and Lightning. Christian Decker, Rusty Russell, uh, and even, uh, uh, I think she's called Nifty Nay on Twitter, and uh, she's really good as well. So finally, how would you assess Blockstream's overall potential liquid lightning mining? Yeah, I forgot about mining. This is a very good one. So mining is one of the core Bitcoin businesses. And the fact that Blockstream has invested tens of megawatts, hundreds of megawatts in mining uh, in Quebec and I think in Georgia as well, or somewhere else in, in Europe, I think it's extremely positive for their business and for the Bitcoin network. So I'd say I, I'd say I, I'm I'm pretty confident on blockchain uh, since they bought a lot of Bitcoin very early, since they're very much into good open source development and mining. Uh, however, I I'm still curious to see how 
lucrative li liquid is going to turn out for them. I, th I think liquid is great. I'm just not, uh, I haven't seen how lucrative it is for them. Uh, but I think it's, it's great for the community of enterprises working on it. So, yes, my check just sent uh, the meetup group uh, where you can find all our events. And there's a real life event coming up next week. Uh, it's uh, the ninth, if I'm not mistaken. And it's going to be uh, in Montreal uh, for those that are situated here. Well, thank you, Austrian boy. Anybody else got any questions? I just sent the slides on the chat for those who want to look at them. Else, uh, if I don't think it seems there's no question, so unless someone jumps in right now. Yeah, okay. I'm going to ask you one, Gustavo. You hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, I wanted to ask you, like, when you first started uh, using a, a Bitcoin Explorer, your 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 first go to place was uh, that the most popular one. It's called the Bitcoin Explorer one, the one that's included with, uh, I think, like my node. Is that the one you were using? Not not exactly. Well, because it, it depends what you're looking for with a Bitcoin Explorer. So that's the first question you gotta ask yourself: Are you looking for a Bitcoin Explorer that will allow you to do the things that I've done today, or like just visually what I've done today? If, if yes, the one that comes with my node is not sufficient because the okay. one that comes with my node uh, has no extra database of data where the data is structured in a more accessible way. The one that comes with my node, which is called BTC RPC Explorer, is uh, can doesn't allow you to look up transactions or addresses. It only allows you to look up blocks. And because of that, it's much less accessible for exploration uh, of that. Um, so so I'd say I started with Block Cipher uh, because Blockstream.info wasn't available back then, but now I'm just using uh, Blockstream.info. Okay. And uh, the other thing I had to ask you was, uh, yesterday there was a, a lot of chatter on Twitter about this big transaction you probably heard about from uh, Whale I Alerts there for like a billion dollars, I think it was, in a certain block. Did you guys look into that? Is there like anything like worth talking about on that? Or uh, To be honest, I'm not much uh, aware of the situation. Uh, I wasn't much on Twitter yesterday, so uh, I, I don't have uh, any thoughts on that, but maybe someone else does. Is that like a big transaction, uh, a billion, or that happens? Like well, no, a billion is a big transaction. It does happen uh, from time to time, right? It has happened a few times before, but it is one of the, big, one of the biggest transactions ever. How, no, I'd say the biggest transaction ever, I think it's 550,000 Bitcoins. But it was okay. like in 2012, so it was worth nothing back then. Well, much okay. less. Uh, but in terms of real-life value, it's around biggest amount yes and there uh, were like so, some people talking about how you know oh they're gonna be there's gonna be a price drop in bitcoin but then you know this could like just be like an exchange that's moving it from one wallet to another i guess yes uh definitely so uh uh yes it could I, i'm not too worried about these things like people worry about that uh but I, personally i'm not i think it's just uh it can be anything, uh, like it can be a whale uh, just wanting to move some coins, but since it's the same UTXO, he's forced to move all his coins. So he's not really moving them, he's just moving a portion out of them, but it seems like he's moving everything. So that's usually the case, and that's why no, I'm not very worried. Cool. Okay, uh, Rene, maybe you want to jump in to mention uh, your presentation that you'll be making in, in a few days? Sure. Can you hear me now? Totally. Okay. Yeah. Just to mention that uh, we're having a. Uh, en fait, c'est plutôt en français. Là. This is going to apply in French. So next next Thursday at two o'clock, we're having a webinar. Uh, the first time we're going to be, uh, you know, addressing legal issues and uh, information protection uh, via Verify. So we're presenting uh, the new bill that was just filed here with the Quebec government. Uh, Bill 64, which basically is going to be modifying uh, the privacy law in Quebec in the private sector and the public sector, uh, GDPR style, so a bit like Europe. Uh, so we want to address that and how that's going to affect uh, 
the information we collect, uh, you know, from uh, from Bitcoiners, whether it's uh, through the KYC process or whether it's uh, when they perform transactions and so on and so forth. So anybody who's interested in privacy and, and the law in Quebec may be interested to attend. It'll be in French. Uh, we may have an English one uh, in the following weeks, but we're starting with a French one uh, next Thursday. Thank you, Rene. It seems certainly very interesting. I know I'll be there. Uh, I hope uh, many other will. Hey, okay. Rene, uh, since, since you were talking, sorry about that, Gustavo, but uh, it's on no topic of uh, what Rene was talking about. Uh, I, uh, you, I work, and not to dox myself too much, but I work in a place where there's a lot of money involved, and uh, they, uh, they had mentioned that we had like a new CANAF training to address all of these new uh, regulations that are coming in. And uh, one of the interesting things that they mentioned was uh, that from now on, like whenever uh, you suspect a, a customer uh, that they're doing a transaction that is just even like a thousand dollars before they changed the vocabulary where it was, if you believe that this is uh, related to uh, criminal activity, now it's not even, the word is not even believe. It's like if you uh, suspect and uh, they, they, they were really putting a lot of emphasis on this new change in the vocabulary of just suspecting someone of being involved in some kind of money laundering operation or type of crime to flag it right away. And if, that if you didn't flag it and you were caught like not flagging these things that you uh, could easily be suspected, they, uh, they could uh, come back to bite you uh, eventually, you know, because uh, you didn't do your, your job. And, and there were another thing that they were saying was, that if you, uh, whoever flags anything uh, that seems suspicious, there would be no um, accountability for that person flagging the people uh, because uh, there's no names being taken down of uh, you uh, saying uh, that you, you, you saw some kind of suspicious activity going on. So it could never come back to you, you know? So I found it all very uh, kind of like Orwellian and uh, bizarre, all these new uh, CANAF regulations that they were talking about. That was like my, my two cents on that. Yeah, yeah. No, Jose, it's quite interesting what you're saying because, uh, you know, uh, us at Verify, we sort of uh, dove into this because, uh, as you may know, uh, we're going to be launching, uh, you know, a, a Bitcoin uh, exchange uh, very shortly. We've been in beta tests now for a few weeks and uh, we're actually, uh, you know, an MSB, a money services business registered with, uh, with FinTrack. Uh, in Canada, so so we have to comply. So we know, you know, we know what these things are. So every transaction that we uh, that we get, you know, first of all, we do KYC when someone opens an account, and then every transaction, uh, we're obliged, you know, if we if we see anything suspicious, uh, to sort of uh, raise the flag, and, and that's why, you know, we we do uh, we do our checks whenever somebody opens an account, you know, we we ask for ID, and if, if there's any kind of suspicion, you know, a lot of people we already know they're opening accounts, so that's okay. But anybody who, who seems suspicious in our mind, you know, we have the responsibility to ask further questions uh, and to flag anything that we feel could be uh, related to money laundering. Yeah, we have no choice. You know, if, if we're going to be, uh, you know, doing any kind of business like this, we we have to sort of comply to these uh, requirements. Agreed. Yes, that's all very interesting, guys. Uh, but just so just so you get you know, the, the the discussion next week is not going to be concerned. You know, no, mind you, that could be another interesting subject we can address eventually. You know, the FinTrack requirements. But next week, it's really the uh, the privacy issue uh, of personal information that we're going to talk about and the, and the legal aspect around that. Uh, but uh, that would be a good idea. You know, you're you're making you know, some some good ideas, perhaps, to sort of address the FinTrack requirements in a, in a presentation eventually. Yeah, it looks inter like an interesting presentation, and I uh, look forward to uh, hearing more uh, what you guys are going to have to say about it. Thanks. Cool, cool. Cool, guys. Thanks uh, to both of you. So there's one last question about uh, from Austrian uh, boy 160 He asked, can you expand on the problems with blockchain.com? Uh, so sure. So blockchain.com, uh, first of all, when I went on their website, uh, the Explorer, I haven't been able to find a lot of Bitcoin information. So uh, I don't think, if, I, I think they've updated now, but uh, very recently, a couple of months ago, they hadn't even implemented SegWit yet, not on their wallet, but on their Explorer. So it means that like 40% of transactions weren't available. 
okay blockstream.info is down right now but uh yeah blockstream.info had that problem uh of not showing a lot of transactions so you would make a transaction you would look it up on blockstream.info and it wouldn't appear uh now it appears now it it, it seems that they've caught on but it took three years this these upgrades were made three years ago and it took them three years to make them however and some other tools made it right away it's it's so simple it's so easy to make it and and they 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 always said like ah oh, we it's not our focus uh we because they were worried about the altcoins and they're like ah oh, we're uh we're worried about user experience not features um and so they always had their excuses However, they were very much against this at the beginning. So it just demonstrates uh, how they were working against the Bitcoin community and how they were working against some upgrades that were that were highly uh, accepted by the community. So to me, this is just an evidence uh, from these uh, these folks that uh, they clearly uh, they clearly have uh, no intention of supporting Bitcoin uh, technical upgrades uh, in the same way as uh, the blockchain folks do. So uh, and and you and what was the the moment when they were opposing SegWit uh, and kind of the Bitcoin core upgrades? Well, it was SegWit 2x uh, that they wanted to work on, and uh, and that was uh, was very negative. So uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, uh, my check wants to say BitPay has just upgraded to SegWit. Ah, oh, nice. I didn't know that. Well, that's another one. That's cool. Uh, BitPayBlockchain.com. So they're finally catching up because obviously they would. They had no choice. This is what the network has chosen. And they were still trying to fight it. Like, uh, I don't understand it. Uh, we'll see what happens next. Uh, now they seem to be more focused on Ethereum. Um, better for us, I guess, because they're, they're not very good players for the ecosystem. Hey, Gustavo, one, one more question uh, that I just remembered. Uh, before you mentioned that to run the Blockstream API, uh, it's kind of like an industrial uh, grade uh, product and it requires uh, Quite a bit of resources is this something that would be able to run on a raspberry pi or you need more like a xeon type of blade server uh, and how much hard drive space uh, would it require uh, this definitely can't run on a raspberry pi uh i tried it uh, i've never succeeded it probably requires uh, uh you can do it on a desktop like a workstation pretty good you can do it you can do it on a xeon server as well uh if you want one, I'm selling one. So uh, that's off topic. Well, I'll verify I sell one. But uh, uh, you probably need uh, around uh, 1.5 terabytes of data of this space available, plus 300 gigabytes from the Bitcoin node. So you need like two terabytes. And you need at least like 200 out of that two terabyte, 200 gigs to be SSD, else it's just not going to compact ever. It's not gonna compile, so you probably I, I'd, I'd probably get like one 500 uh, gig SSD plus two terabyte H hard drive. That's the best you can go in terms of disk RAM. I, I've some requirements or what they advise to. They they haven't responded yet. Uh, I think you can probably you can you can probably do it on something with eight gigs of RAM, but it's just gonna take like t a week, two weeks, like. Uh, but you can do it on, on on a virtual machine. You can you can do it on. I, I don't know if you can do it on a Raspberry Pi though, I, because maybe because of the ARM architecture, and also because of uh, of the CPU requirements. So so Cipher Node seems to be like uh, less uh, resource intensive. I think that would be able to run on a Raspberry Pi, right? Exactly. Cipher Node is much less resource intensive. Intensive. It's it's a much better option. Uh, but Cipher Node is. It's like a, it's, it's like I said, it's a partial explorer, Siphonol. Uh, it's like a BTC RPC explorer, but in like an API. Uh, so Siphonol, let's say, it's much less for analysis. However, it can be leveraged for analysis. It's much more for wallet management uh, and for uh, uh, like a Bitcoin programmability between many layers. So Siphonol is really good at uh doing uh, an operation that requires bitcoin that requires liquid that requires lightning and you can all program it together or or Cephanol is very good for uh y using bitcoin for uh, web applications so if you develop an exchange Cephanol is really good for that 
uh, particularly if you're doing like some complex Bitcoin operations, if you're doing coin join, if you're doing batching, if you're uh, things like that. So let's say um, you can have, let's say, say you have users on your website and they want to buy Bitcoin. Uh, well, you can just uh, add that to your batch of transactions. And once uh, everybody's ready to go, every now 10, 15 minutes have passed. Well, it just, the transaction just goes on with 50 outputs and every output uh, calls back a different URL to a different user to let them know that the transaction uh, has been set. So it's, it's really good for web application development uh, and for Bitcoin, multi-Bitcoin operation. All right, thanks for clearing that up. All right, so I think we're done for this week. So uh, like I said, thank you all for being here, guys. It was really fun. Uh, I'm glad you liked it. This will be on YouTube uh, as soon as uh, the beginning of next week. Uh, the previous one is already on YouTube. If you missed it, it was on Lectrum. Uh, so though I, I sent the slides. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter to, for, to be aware of the next presentations and the, and the next content. Uh, but else, uh, you'll find a meetup that there's a presentation on Thursday by Rene, like he mentioned, uh, and there's a meetup uh on thursday as well uh much later however at uh, 6 p.m uh, at parc maisonneuve in montreal so i'll see you then everybody uh thank you for all to being here all right have a good uh, weekend